Hi everyone, welcome to Bach Jazz. We are now live streaming on Facebook and we are also recording. This webinar will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel and website. I'm Lambros and I'm one of the general coordinators of the Bach Jazz team, uh, which is a youth-led initiative that uh, wants to explore the histories of Cyprus and we are inviting everyone to join us. <clears throat> All of our work is on a, based on a voluntary basis. And uh, if you like what we do and you want to support us, you can make a donation on our beautiful website, historiesofbachjes.org. And don't forget to follow us on social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Um, if you feel uh, you want to be part of our team, please get in touch with us. And uh, we are still growing and we welcome people from all the communities on board. Today, I will be moderating this webinar together with Desire. Hello, Desire. Hi, everyone. Um, so the webinar consists of a 40 minute presentation and then there'll be 40 minutes for a Q&A afterwards. Um, and feel free to write any questions you have during the webinar in the chat or on the Facebook Live event. Um, the webinar today is called Conceptual Change and Progress. What can we learn from Wittgenstein's philosophy? And we have Evren Salsabeb with us today, who's a PhD candidate in philosophy at Bilkent University in Ankara. Uh, he completed his master's in philosophy at the University of Bristol and also his bachelor's in history in, and politics at Newcastle University. Um, he's interested in social and political philosophy, especially social ontology and democratic theory. Hi, Evren Sal. Welcome. Hi. Thank you for the introduction. So... Let me share my screen. Yeah, this is this should be okay. So yeah, hi. So today in this talk, I will explain philosophical approach towards understanding concepts by philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. And then I will show how this approach um, can actually, how we can learn some lessons from this approach and how this can be useful for historians, archeologists, and also to us, to us in our daily lives, in our social and political practices. So there are many different concepts and they can also be sorted by subjects. So there are mathematical concepts, there are scientific concepts, there are the concepts within physics and etc. But today I will focus mainly on social and political concepts, including justice, gender, virtue, and many others. And philosophers have been interested with such concepts from the very beginning, from the days of Socrates walking around in ancient Greece and annoying people with his endless questions. And this will also be my starting point today. So this, the, this has come to be known as the standard practice to concept. This is also called the concept process. And it involves us in the question of his acts. So what is knowledge, what is justice, what is truth, and what is virtue? And the aim in asking this question is to find a definition, a common core or essential property. So the aim is to that when we are listing cases of knowledge, for instance, or examples of knowledge or examples of virtue, our definition should meet, should satisfy all of these cases. So we are looking for some excellence common to those things which are X. So we are looking for the essence of being knowledge, for instance. And again, the definition that we come up with must include in the standard practice, must include all the cases of knowledge and exclude other cases that are not knowledge. And Socrates preferred this um, approach because he believed that nothing can really be understood properly if it's not defined clearly. So he, before we actually can go on to see how we can apply these concepts or we could go into a discussion of them in different contexts, we should first make sure that we define them clearly. However, in, act, in reality, or at least from the um, Plato's dialogues, um, this approach left Socrates very unsatisfied. So I'm going to read 
an exchange between me now and Socrates from Plato's book, me now. And after Socrates asks him the question of what is virtue, Mino replies, there will be no difficulty, Socrates, in answering your question, what is virtue? Let us take first the virtue of a man. He should know how to administer the state and the administration of it to benefit his friends and harm his enemies. And he must also be careful not to suffer harm himself. himself. A woman's virtue, if you wish to know about that, may also be easily described. Her duty is to order her house and keep what is indoors and obey her husband. Every age, every condition of life, young or old, male or female, bond or free, is a different virtue. There are virtues numberless and no lack of definitions of them. For virtues relative to the actions and ages of each of us in all that we do. And Socrates, in his famous, with his famous irony, replies by saying, how fortunate I am, Mina, you know, when I ask you for one virtue, you present me with a swarm of them. And so of the virtue, and he goes on to say, so the virtues, although they may be different than many of them, they have all a common nature, which makes them virtues. And we see a similar reply by Socrates when he asks in Theotetus um, for a definition of knowledge. Again, he is unsatisfied and he says, you're offering many examples when I ask for something simple. I ask for something simple and you respond with complexity. And it is possible to imagine Socrates, like in the picture on the right, being very unsatisfied to the answers that he receives. And the result of these um, dialogues is that they cannot actually come up with a good definition that satisfies Socrates and the person. And the result is aporia, which basically means puzzlement. So now I want to, um, now you have, the, you, you have the chance to have a go at coming up with a definition. So we're going to play a small game in modern games. So I want you to first think of a definition for the concept game. And I'll wait for like 30 seconds. And please write in the chat or say it out loud if you can come up with a definition. Can someone beat me in the chat? I can't, I said right in the chat, I can't access the chat. Can our moderators help me with that? So one person said uh, rules, Manos said the rules, Maria said okay. fun. Okay. Yeah, I would uh, personally okay. I would I mean, say, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. An activity with a set of rules, yeah. Being a child involves one or more players, has a set of rules they follow. Okay, that's, that's very good. Um, oh, I mean, I, I need to go on, I continue now. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we've got another one. Oh. Competing. Competing, okay, okay, these are very good. So now I want you to think of some examples of games. Think of as many as you can find. And now I want you to think if your definition, definition that you've given to me, captures all your examples. So, yeah, let's write this. Oh, yeah, let's look at them together. So, this. This has actually been, um, this example has been put forward by Wittgenstein himself in the philosophic investigation. And so here are some examples of games. So there's football, basketball, chess, um, hula hooping, card games, solitaire, um, board games, and Olympic games. And so, so yeah, I think I, I received some good guys and some of them has been also called by Wittgenstein as well so I think Maria said it should involve something fun and um, Wittgenstein says that are they all amusing which kind of comes to the same thing but then when we look into the actual example in chess which doesn't seem that amusing to me at least I mean hula hooping seems quite fun and amusing but playing chess maybe not so much and then some 
people some um, said it should involve competition in between players, but then we have a card game called Solitaire. We can actually play it on your own. Um, then we have rules, but just saying rules would involve many other things as well, because uh, like traffic has rules as well, but I don't think we'd consider traffic as a game. And also imagine a child just like hitting a ball at a wall and just catching it back again. It doesn't seem that that game has very strict rules to it. It's just that the child is making So it seems like we have a small problem with the internet connection. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, now you're back. Oh, okay. Where did, where did I, what was the last thing I said? <laughs> you were saying about um, um, that the rules include traffic also. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so. Actually, I, yeah, okay. Okay, so, yeah, so as you can see, our definition does not capture all the examples. It leaves some of them out and it just includes other ones as well that we wouldn't want to include in our definition of games. And from this, following from, from this example, Wittgenstein challenges the standard practice. And he argues, don't say there must be something common or they would not be called games. But look and see whether there is anything common to all. Or if you look at them, you will not see something that's common to all, but similarities, relationships, and a whole series of them at, at that. To repeat, don't think, but look. So Wittgenstein wants you to look at actual examples of games rather than to try and come up with a definition and see that there is actually no common thing that unites them. It's just they have some similarities in them. And from this, he introduces the notion of family resemblance, which is that games form a family and the members, the examples of games have family likenesses. So the concept game has a family of meaning. And he, he calls this family resemblance because if you think about a family, they may share various features between them, such as um, some of them have the same nose, others have the same eyebrow, others, again, the same way of walking, same characteristics. But it's not that they don't have, if you look into a family tree, they don't have one feature that um, defines them. And instead, following from this, um, Wittgenstein argues against coming up with very strict definitions like Socrates, and instead argues that we should accept that these kind of concepts have family resemblance to them. This is our way, this is the best way to understand them. And he actually calls um, Socrates is method, the craving for generality. So he says that the idea that in order to be clear about the meaning of a general term, one had to find a common element in all its applications has shackled philosophical investigation, where it has not only led to no result, aporia, but also made the philosophers dismiss as irrelevant, irre irrelevant the concrete cases, which alone could have helped him to understand the use of the general term. So I think the first lesson we can get the first proposition from here that there is no essential definitions of concepts, but they, as we should understand our concepts having um, several a family of, but we should not expect the essence that allows us to define a concept. Now moving on to the second argument that I'm going to discuss today. And it's that is that the meaning of a word is used in a language such that someone has given. And Einstein offers a language game. So we perform different acts with our language. We describe the appearance of an object, a capture facts, create an event, and so on. And he argues that it is things that that are specific to our portal. I'm sorry, guys, I think I was gone again. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why is this happening, but okay, let's continue. 
Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, and he gives this idea of language games. So think about a builder, Bob, and his assistant. Um, Bob, in, in the language game between Bob and his assistant, the word brick basically means bring me a brick. So every time they say brick, it means bring me a brick. But let's think about different language games. So let's say our moderator, Ram Brooks, has bought a new phone. And I believe that the phone is too large. It's like a very large phone. And then as a joke, I start calling the phone a brick. And then I tell these other people as well. And in our, in our group of friends, the word brick basically means Lambrox's phone. It denotes that object. And again, let's give another example. Let's say our other moderator, Desira, and I have a mutual friend who posts very unintelligent stuff on Facebook. And as a joke, maybe an unkind joke, we start calling him a brick to say that he is thick as a brick. And after that, and we tell these other people as well. And in our language games, the word brick means that person, it denotes that person. So, and this, like these are very trivial examples that I've given, but I think it explains it nice. It also applies to social and political concepts because social and political concepts have different meanings with the use of different times, different cultures, and different epochs in a way. And so let's say the word democracy, for instance, it means something different to us when we think about it, but it meant probably something very different, or a bit different, at least, <laughs> to people in ancient Greece talking about democracy. So the second lesson I believe that we can get from Wittgenstein is that there's no essential meanings, and that the meaning is that we give the meaning by using the concepts ourselves. And I believe the two lessons together, no essential definitions, no essential meanings, shows that Wittgenstein, in a way, has an anti-essentialist project. And so now I will discuss two papers. Um, one of them is talks about, um, and these papers talk about the issues in history of ideas, um, archaeology and anthropology. And these are issues arise because of essentialism. And then I will show how adopting a Wittgenstein approach can actually help overcome these worries. If these historians or archaeologists looked at this, they would have benefited in a way. So first we have Quentin Skinner, who you can see on the right, and his um, article, very famous article, Meaning Understanding in the History of Ideas. Um, Skinner discusses various problems within the history of ideas and intellectual which is basically the study of the history of human thought and intellectuals. And he especially focuses on those that study the text itself, the text in itself. So they focus on the text. And I'm going to read out some quotes from um, Skinner. And these, I believe, show the aim of the historians in their own words. So you can see in quotation marks some um, phrases. And these are all taken from these history of ideas textbooks. So the whole point it is characteristically said of studying aspects of philosophy or literature might be that they contain in a favorite phrase, timeless elements in the form of universal ideas, even a dateless wisdom with universal application. So the aim in these books is recurring the timeless questions and answers and demonstrate their continuing relevance. And again, they are going to find fundamental concepts and abiding questions. And lastly, it's the aim is to provide a real place of the classic writings quite apart from the context of historical development as perennially important attempts to set down universal propositions about political reality. So these is some historians believe that there is a political reality that is um, in a way timeless. It's just spans from ancient prehistoric times to today. And they try to gather some universal propositions from these philosophers that can add to this political, singular political reality. The problem, however, is the lack of time elements, and that the historian actually approaches the text with concepts and paradigms and some meanings that are applicable to him and to us or to her, but not necessarily to philosophers that he or she investigates. So, and one problem that arises is that the historian approaches the text with certain expectations. So let's look into some examples. So first we have Marsilius of Padua, an Italian scholar in the 14th century. And at one point in his book, Defender of the Peace, he offers some remarks on the executive role of a ruler 
compared with the legislative role of a sovereign people. And the modern commentator who is familiar with the doctrine of um, separation of power um, from the American Revolution as an important condition of political freedom tries to find this idea in Marsilius as well. So despite the fact that Marsilius was not even concerned with the issue of political freedom and the concept of separation of powers was not even applicable to, to his time because he lived in the 14th century. Some historians have questioned whether Marsilius should be said to have a, had a doctrine on the separation of powers. And if so, whether he should be the acclaimed founder of the doctrine. But this is quite absurd because he could, Marsilius could not have contributed to a debate whose terms were unavailable to him. It would be, if you told Marsilius that the separation of power was just that word, just that concept, it would be very meaningless to him because it doesn't apply to his time. So certain, it shows that certain concepts are not timeless elements, but they are meaningful to us and they cannot be easily applied to past philosophers. Otherwise, they'll be anachronistic concepts. And an anachronism is the action of attributing something to a period which it does not belong. Um, so let's look at some other examples quickly. So Montesquieu, French philosopher from the 18th century. Oh, another common issue in this field is to praise or blame these philosophers on how they have come closer to our way of thinking in a way. So the examples make it clear. So Montesquieu um, anticipates, he apparently anticipates the ideals of full employment and the welfare, welfare state which again, welfare state is not a term that applies to 18th century philosophy. And Machiavelli, Italian diplomat and philosopher from the 15th and 16th century, is argued to talk about politics essentially as we do. And this is his lasting significance. And then the other, his contemporaries are blamed because, or they are criticized because they did not do the same and which makes their political views completely unreal because they believe there's singular political reality. Um, and also, we also expect some philosophers to contribute to some, like this historian of ideas expects some philosophers to contribute to ideas that are, again, important to us in our times, especially like political concepts. And they, again, criticize them for that. So Plato, who lived um, 424 BC, <laughs> um, he's criticized for omitting the influence of public opinion. Well, John Locke, who lived in the 17th century, is criticized for um, not making it, not making his views very clear on universal suffrage. And Locke is also even criticized for failing to advocate the world state. Again, concepts that are that would be really meaningless. And then, as a last example, Rousseau, a historian of ideas, argues that Rousseau should be given special responsibility for the emergence of totalitarianism. But again, it cannot be his intention because totalitarianism emerged in the 20th century, whereas Rousseau lived in the 18th century. So it's, I guess it's a bit unfair to blame Rousseau for um, give Rousseau responsibility for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think this shows that such concepts are meaningful to us, but not to past philosophers. And they are part, they are part of our form of life, but not theirs. And so they are they are not essential, universal, and timeless concepts. And I think Wittgenstein's approach shows this nicely. And I believe a historian ideas, ideas, if he or she studied Wittgenstein, can take this as a lesson on how we should approach um, past philosophers or past um, literature works. Next, I will um, look into anthropology and archaeology. And uh, yes, I'll be focusing on the paper that you can see on the right, Archaeology and the Study of Gender. And in this paper, the two authors um, criticize the methodology in these fields for anthrocentrism, which basically means a male-centered worldview. And it, is, it involves a tendency to disregard the female contribution to society and culture. So the contributions, the activities, perceptions, perspectives of females are trivialized. They are stereotypes or they are simply ignored. And so if you start with anthropology, which is the study of aspects of humans within past and present societies, and we, some researchers who approach this field 
they presume essential and natural gender characteristics. So they assume males are stronger, more aggressive, dominant, more active, more important, whereas females are weak, passive, and dependent. They use such gender stereotypes very uncritically. And in doing so, they do not realize that gen and they also apply this in determining gender roles and a division of sexual labor. So we have another small technical issue and Brenzel is back. Excellent. Um, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so I just said you're getting used to it now, I guess. I do apologize for, yeah, that's kind of. Um, yeah, so they are in a way, um, assuming this essential natural gender characteristics, they're applying it to different um, cultures in their studies, which brings out very inaccurate results because cultures are different and gender roles in different cultures are different as well. And then when we move to archaeology, some which is the study of uh, material remains of human life and activities, um, some researchers have cultural specific beliefs about the meaning of masculine and feminine about capabilities of men and women, about their power relationship, and about the appropriate roles in society. So archaeologists, consciously or not, some of them at least, are propagating culturally particular ideas about gender in the interpretations and reconstructions of the past. So again, this leads to a strict sexual division of labor, and they attribute and they link some jobs with a certain gender. And they also, archaeologists also link some artifacts with genders as well, which I'm going to give examples in a second. And this has been, such approaches has been um, kind of, they follow the men, the hunter model, which again, um, the studies that go and um, follow that model usually bring preconceived notions about what each sex ought to do. And, notions serve to structure the ways artifacts are interpreted. So when, when archaeologists are in burying burial contexts and grinding pestles are found, and I actually found one in my house, so I can show you what it is if you don't know. This is the item, and you basically put something in it like that, and like let's say nuts, and then you, you know, like grind them. I mean, I don't know if people in the past ages used use it to grind nuts, but that's what I usually use it for. And so when these, the grinding pestles are found with females in burial contexts, they are interpreted as reflecting the grinding and food processing activities of women. When they are found with males, they suggest that men must have manufactured these artifacts or utilized them as hammerstones in pursuing other, and this implies that pursuing other less feminine tasks. And yet, I think this suggests that they are approaching it with their own ideas of what each gender ought to do because they don't have any um, strong evidence that this is actually how that, um, that women actually use this for um, food processing activities, whereas male definitely don't use it for that, but they use it for other activities, less feminine activities. It is applying your own understanding of what each gender ought to do to past times, which is very problematic. And the second example is the Atlatils, which I couldn't unfortunately found at my house. So but here's the picture of it. <laughs> and it's basically the spare stroller, which was used in the, again past times. Um, and actually, when again in burial sites, these are actually found rather commonly in female burials. But some writers offer several possible explanations of why this might be found with, um, why these are found with females. So it could be that women use them as part of a ceremony or, or other similar activities. And then even, but they, they also consider the possibility that they may, might have hunted with these as well. But 
the way they um, write this or the way they explain this is that they make it clear that this is expected to be a symbol of male activity and that something needs to be explained why um, females have also used this for hunting. But we don't like that is something that may be may seem meaningful to those historians, but it does not necessarily explain the past time. It might be very well be the case that both men and women hunted in, the, in those times, but they approach it with essential ideas on what you can do to do so. Yeah, so I think so far I've explained that there isn't an essential definition of concepts and that the meaning of a word is determined by its use in a linguistic community. So concepts are not timeless elements. It's just how we go on with our language games, our shared practices, practices that's how we give meanings to certain concepts. And, and I try to show that the meanings of social and political concepts change with their use in different periods, cultures, and contexts. Some concepts that we now use would be meaningless to people in the past, and some concepts that we now use would have different meanings. They would have changing meanings in the past as well. And I think this is important, important thing to keep in mind when we are um, working in the fields of history, again, um, anthropology, archaeology. But now there is another problem, because if meanings of such social and political con um, concepts are contingent and that we have, that they are they just how we go on. They're just like um, a future of our lives and that there is no reflective way of reaching these concepts. They just happen to be there and we just use them. So it shows that there's no reason for preferring the concepts that we use over other alternatives. And this leads to relativism, which is now a, is a scary word, <laughs> I guess, and such that there is no conclusive argument for preferring the concepts we have over the alternatives. And reading Wittgenstein, just reading Wittgenstein, doesn't it doesn't show that he actually can help us in this field as well because he believes that the job of philosophy is not to explain anything. But it is really descriptive, so we should only explain different descriptive and language games, but not try to give explanations of why this might be. It's just there. But um, there has been some, in a way, recent um, ways of trying to come up with how a Wittgenstein approach can still be can still avoid relativism, and this has been achieved by differentiating between right Wittgensteinism and left Wittgensteinism. And this has first been done by the philosopher Bernard Williams. And so right Wittgensteinism is a descriptive enterprise with undiscriminate, undiscriminating acceptance of concepts. So it's basically also what Wittgenstein appears to be saying. But there can also be left Wittgensteinism, and point -based, which follows a point-based explanation of our concepts. And I'm going to be discussing the paper that you can see again on the right. And they have um, argued further on the distinction that Bernard Williams made. So left Wittgensteinism is a dynamic view of our conceptual practices as subject to reason-driven change in response to change in response to changes. Yeah, in response to changes in our needs and purposes. So if we adopt this approach, we are not seeing concepts as answering to timeless problems that anyone faces. Not whether anyone has reason to prefer the concept we have or the alternative. So we're not falling into the absurdities that it has been that I've just described. But we are seeing them as reasons for an inclusive we, whether they are the best for us, whether they um, serve, whether they serve our needs, our purposes in a way. So we shift from viewing concepts as answers to timeless problems to viewing them as answers to more local ones. And Sally Haslinger nicely puts it in this approach by saying we should look into how what work we want these concepts to do for us and why do we need them at all. And following this approach would also allow us to see that concepts that there can actually be conceptual practice worth endorsing and conceptual practices worth rejecting. So there is some an important um, sense of reflective um, awareness going on with the use of our concepts. So let's see, let's, I'm going to discuss an example of how this can be 
Please, please. Um, the case. Yeah. Okay, so Sally Hassan there, who you can see on the right. Um, try to apply this idea to understand to the concepts of gender and race. And he approaches it from a feminist anti-racist point of view. And he questions what might feminist anti-racist want or need concept, the concept, why would they want to have the concepts of gender and race? What work can they do for us? And he argues that, she argues that the task is to develop accounts of gender and race that will be effective tools in the fight against injustice. So they have a point that they're going to save this concept. And then she goes on to argue that gender can be answered as a social class. So gender is the social meaning of sex. And she tries to bring a hierarchy in her concept of gender. So she goes on to conceptualize a woman, for instance. S is a woman, if and only if S is systematically subordinated along some dimension, economic, political, legal, social, social. And S is marked as a target for this treatment by observed or imagined bodily features presumed to be evidence of a female biological role in reproduction. And similarly, S is a man, if and only if, S is systematically privileged for the same reason. Um, like along um, economic political dimensions and for his bodily futures that we can perceive. And it also applies to race, the group is racialized, if and only if its members are socially positioned, a subordinate, subordinate or privileged, privileged along some dimension, and the group is marked as a target for this treatment by observed and imagined bodily features presumed to be evidence of ancestral links to a certain geographical region. So, yeah. so Hassan wants to use these concepts in a way to identify and explain persist inequalities between genders and between people of different colors. So it serves a point for her. Um, Another one is can be seen in, I believe, um, the concept of masculinity. So masculinity, there has been some norms associated with masculinity, um, such as traditional norms of masculinity, such as extreme self-reliance, domination of other men through violence, avoiding the appearance of femininity or traits associated with femininity, and so on. However, um, people have criticized such um, norms that has been associated with um, masculinity. And I believe they wanted to problematize the concept itself. And in a way to do so, they introduced toxic masculinity. So in a way we are taking some of the meanings associated with masculinity and applying it to a different concept that we have um, generated in order to say that this is in a way not how we want masculinity to be defined and understood. But these are instances of toxic masculinity, and masculinity should instead be understood differently. Another example it comes from um, what, in a way, we are trying to do, I believe. Um, so, and before I talk about budgets, um, some of you might remember Maria has presented a talk on history wars. And she argued that there is like a debate going on between traditional patriotic views of history teaching and reformed and new history. So the patriotic views focus on whether history should, they argue that history should teach the values of the nation. It is used to build national identity and shape national concept, consciousness. And yeah, and Against this, there's been some criticism saying that history should be more um, include the things that the country, the bad things in a way that the country did as well, and we shouldn't, it shouldn't have political purposes and so on, maybe. <laughs> and yeah, so going on from this, we can see that our traditional understanding of history and especially history teaching has some meanings that come with it, such as shaping national consciousness that we may not want to have. And in order to, um, and this has also happened when we were discussing on our slogan with Bachas as well. First, it was called the history of Cyprus, but then we thought this has some, his, the word history of Cyprus may have some meanings that come with it, such as it just points to a very one way linear viewpoint of the history. It only includes a single, it only includes, for instance, political history, but doesn't look into all the different 
um, such as gender history, environmental history, and all the other important history that we should study. And yeah, and in order to, we have had a long discussion about this, I think, a few sessions. In order to problematize, try to problematize the concept of history teaching, we tried to come up with um, the word histories and we put a little a mark next to it as well. And I think, again, that is to show that we are not very happy with the way the concept of history, the teaching is to understood and that it should change. And maybe doing so, like um, offering another alternative might also be a way to put the actual uh, meaning of history under a supremacy and to challenge it and to offer alternative definitions. Um, so yeah, that is um, all from me. Um, I believe that adopting the left definition approach and point-based explanations is quite useful because it, I believe it gives us, first, it allows us to use our concepts in an engaged way. We can shape them according to our purposes, uh, needs, which are changing as well. Second, it gives us some freedom with our concepts and we can put them into reflective, we can be reflective towards them, we can discriminate some of them, reject some of them, apply new ones. And yeah, I believe that it allows us, also, it also allows us, gives us, um, it's also useful in our social and political um, practices as well, because we can, like as Haslanger did, she offered a, new definition of gender that challenges the patriarchal definition of gender. And we try to, in Bahati, we try to problematize the concept of history to move away from the traditional understanding of teaching history and so on. So yeah, this is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you, everyone, sir. That was a very interesting talk with a lot to process. Um, so we're going to move to the Q&A. Uh, so if anyone wants to ask a question on Zoom, you can move your mouse and click on the participants button. Then you press raise your hand, raise hand uh, at the bottom right corner. Um, and if you can't find it, then you could click on the reactions as well. Um, it's also possible to ask a question on the Facebook Live. And we'd be really grateful to receive any feedback, positive or negative that you'd have. So we're going to post the feedback form in the chat on Zoom now, and the form's also available on the Facebook Live. Thanks. Yeah, thank you from me as well, Evrensel. Um, really insightful um, webinar and topics. Um, so we'll go to our first question from uh, Maria Yeoryu. Today, the internet connection in Cyprus is not good. <laughs> it's not helping. Shall I go ahead? Yes, please. Yes. Because I cannot hear you probably. Um, I think it's the football, that's why. Evrenzel, <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, uh, for me, it was fascinating to, to listen to this presentation because as someone who works in history, teaching and learning, I feel that we don't problematize concepts enough. Um, so thank you for this uh, presentation. I one thing I was thinking is that concepts do not simply change in time; they change in space. Uh, for example, again to take the example of um, um, history teaching and. Uh, Learning, we would say that a, 
uh, being a soldier in the, the medieval times is not the same as being a soldier in the in World War I uh, or now. And also fighting would not be the same in Europe as it would be, let's say, uh, in the Americas or in Asia. So uh, for me, thinking concepts also differently in different spaces uh, um, needs to be discussed. Um, so I have a, a, a question. Um, so you mentioned, um, you pointed out that concepts are not timeless, but they are a response to our current questions and problems. I wonder how we could work with this um, principle without falling to relativism. Um, you made the connection to, to webinar one, which was about cultural wars. And uh, one of the reasons we often get into very heated arguments is because we debate things such as state. What is the state? For whom is the state? Um, who is a refugee? Who is a migrant? Who is not? So my, my question, a, a reflection, and I, I don't know if you have an answer to this, is how do we stick to the principle of always being alert to concepts, but not falling into relativism where we can never reach an answer? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question as well. Um, I, I think there's like two different issues that we have like at hand here in a way, because like we can actually um, like reflectively use our concepts by gathering new information, uh, deliberating about them, thinking about our concepts as well. And I think that's one and our changing times also gives us some new ideas about how we should use our concepts. So the concept of um, how we should gender, for instance. But I think it is a different area in convincing people to our concepts on how we should be able to, because debate usually, I mean, it's a common problem that when we debate with other people, they also have their concepts. For instance, the difference between a patriarchal definition of woman and a feminist definition of woman. And sometimes when we're trying to debate and explain people why our concept is the better one, is the one that we should prefer, it usually doesn't get us anywhere because of poor deliberative practices and so on. But I don't think um, I don't think this should this does not lead, lead us to relativism because we, in a way, like people, like let's say feminists, um, do shape their concepts through some reflections. They think about how these are going. They get new evidence. They see how things play out in real life and so on. And then they add these to their concepts. And if they're if we can like look into different concepts now as well, but if our ideas keep changing as well, then we can realize that and continue to change our concepts. It's just that, yeah. So I'm not sure if it if it would if this can be characterized too as relativism because we're not saying everything goes. We are giving some good reasons, but it's a different area to convince other people that the reasons that we're given is actually good reasons, and that would at least need some more work. But yeah, it shouldn't be good. And yeah, I mean, I thought what you said about space was interesting as well. And I think spaces are an important feature of our form of life, which is something um, Wittgenstein likes as well. It's a concept that he puts forth as well. So yeah, changing spaces, I do agree that they can allow us to, like, they can change our concepts as well. It's not just time. Thank you, Rensel, for your answer, and Maria for your question and intervention. Um, if I may, I'm going to ask something. Uh, I mean, so philosophy of language is that? It's a quite simple question. Is it? Is is this what it, uh, Wittgenstein wants to um, push and encourage? Is the philosophy of language questioning concepts and under like the, yeah 
questioning what concepts and trying to understand better what things are because yeah is it is it related? yeah i mean yeah. yeah i mean he he works in the field of philosophy of language and some of the arguments can be seen as arguments that come from the language but um i mean some of Wittgenstein's remarks can also be seen very methodological. So he wants us to see that philosophy is purely descriptive, that we should only describe different language games, and that we shouldn't really go on to explain things, which is a very radical move to make in a way. But yeah, so I think it's, uh, I mean, some of the, the ideas that are just like meaning is use and language games, that they come from philosophy of language. But I think even in those, there are some like underlying assumptions and my like, arguments that show that he has a different um, idea of how philosophy should be done and challenging um, all the assumptions, all the um, practices. So, in the case of uh, history, since we are examining history now, I mean, what would Wittgenstein like argue for? Like, um, I mean, the language we use when we talk about history usually is the language given to us from uh, the state or the history books. So are the, the terminologies that they give us, are these things that we have to try to understand and put in our context or question? Um, yeah, I mean, he gives this idea of like linguistic communities, and I think your linguistic community will include your school and so the government, and you know, it will include society as well. And I think he argues that meanings do get shaped in the practices within these linguistic communities. But you can also have some like subgroups, so you can, um, yeah, you can. They can belong to a different subgroup, and then you will have some different meanings, like different, you will use different words in that subgroup as well, they will have different purposes, and then you can also shape your meanings in that as well. Or also, like with globalization and all, where we have more connections as well. So maybe we can also see some universal, like linguistic, our universe community has also enlarged as well. So there's some words that in like the old times we wouldn't would be meaningless to us like some words that let's say used in america would be meaningless to us in cyprus but not because of all the connections we can actually have some universal um meanings as well for instance thank you Evansel. i think maria has another question maria joe to you i would like to to build on what um, Lambros uh, um, brought up, uh, specifically the concept of history. So uh, Evrenzel, I think, at the beginning, at the very beginning, you said, in order to understand something clearly, we should include the, the, the property of what it is, X, let's say, and exclude what is not X. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, that's the standard practice followed by Socrates that Wittgenstein criticizes. So if we... If we follow this principle and say we can understand something in a clear manner, if we start from excluding what, let's say, history is not, if we want to talk about history, uh, we could say, for example, because there is so much, as, as, as you very acutely pointed out, so much disagreement about what is history uh, and defining it, and um, we could by saying, for example, history is not collective memory. Um, of course, many people wouldn't like this definition, but 
it's maybe a way to start seeing clearer what is history and start finding a definition. So history um, is not collective memory or is, then, is not the kind of collective memory that is not being historized uh, or is not personal memory or um, uh, history, oral history in the condition that um, a and B. Um, so I, I find this a very helpful um, uh, principle in, in start defining things, even though, as you said, Wittgenstein does not agree <laughs> with this principle. But, but I think you're actually following the Wittgenstein principle yourself because you are actually offering some examples and some argument like definition. And you're saying that, if I understood right, that if we start offering some of these explanations, we can actually reach an alternate history. And that's what Wittgenstein wants to do. He wants to look at a family of meanings that will allow us to understand what history is. Whereas as Socrates and the standard practice wants to have a very strict definition and then see whether the cases in, uh, satisfy a definition or not. So you have to first so, for the, yeah, go on. Would you say that one works in a deductive manner and the other one in an inductive manner? Um, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure if that would be the right uh, characterization of it, but for one, you need to be able to come up with a definition first. For the other, mm -hmm. you need to think of all the examples and then come up with a few different meanings and then say that these meanings all satisfy and allow us to understand this concept. So the other, like Wittgenstein approach doesn't even, wants to do away with definitions basically. So we don't want to really focus on a secret, a strict, a fixed meaning of a concept or a word. I mean, usually a concept, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. That's fine. Thank you, Marianne Redzel again. Um, Louise has a question. Yes, Brent uh, Russell, thanks for all the, all the food for thought. Um, one of the things that came to my mind is um, this issue of uh, historians going back to the the fundamental texts or the the, the big kind of um, uh, texts from the the past, and I was thinking that uh, one of the things that has uh, one of the issues that has come out of uh, movements um, such as the fem the sort of feminist movement in let's say history or uh, more recently, the movement for decolonizing uh, history, um, is that it's, uh, it's not that these texts were the only, let's say, texts that existed in the past, the ones that have kind of made it as the, 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 the big ones, um, uh, that uh, other texts also existed, it's just that people um, either, first of all, they might not be texts at all, uh, which is very problematic for historians, uh, or they they were sort of sidelined in favor of um, of these these more kind of um, powerful texts. And the question here for me is, well, of course, um, we have an obligation as historians to, to try and uh, un discover or rediscover and bring to light these other, these other texts, let's say, uh, in what, whichever form they might, uh, they might come. Uh, but it's really problematic when uh, we don't have much to, to go by. So let's say we, we know that, let, let's go back to the example of, again, Maria's um, presentation from a few weeks back, uh, this issue of, sort of slavery and slave owners. Um, it's, it's very common to have all of these, these texts by people who either 
uh, uh, sort of were slave owners or sort of defended um, ownership for a while. Um, we also have texts by other, let's say, white people who uh, were against slavery, but we don't have uh, any thought that comes from, or very little written evidence that might come from uh, uh, sort of the people who were enslaved. I mean, I, I'm not a historian of slavery, so I don't really know if this is the case, but uh, thinking along those lines, what happens when we, when we lack the evidence? How do we act as, as historians then? I guess it's a bigger problem in archaeology where you don't have any written evidence at all or very little. Yeah, I mean, that is a problem. I'm not exactly sure on how that can be avoided, but I do know that there are some, like, they have discovered in, especially the history of philosophy, some texts written by women philosophers in the past who were, as you said, were omitted, like, First of all, they were not texts, they were just like some writing. And because people refused to review them, they um, they could not improve their um, the quality of the arguments as well, because no one would want to um, be a reviewer and publish the text as well. And yeah, secondly, they're sidelined. Then also some of the texts we see them appear in different names. So they, the woman philosophers have to use different names to be able to publish their text. And yeah, there are some like projects I think that are happening to be able to recover these texts and to include, but I agree that it's a, a big problem because when we like, especially this true philosophy, it's all white males um, and there's no other person in a way. And I think it's a good project to try to bring these out to see some different perspectives from those times and how um, the um, philosophers from different backgrounds and different um, social classes have thought about those issues as well. I think it would allow us a larger like, knowledge of the subject. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure on how, what can be done when there is no text available at all. I think that's an even bigger problem, especially in archeology, span but it's just, yeah. So to me, there is an ethical dilemma here for the historian, uh, whether you, uh, continue to criticize these texts from the standpoint uh, of, you know, the 21st century or whatever. Uh, find these inconsistencies, let's say, in relation to sort of where we are today, uh, versus bringing sort of to light um, so criticizing them through their, you know, contemporary texts, it's, it's, it's a big ethical kind of hmm. But I mean, I think we can adopt a different approach as well. I don't think history and other ideas shouldn't, doesn't necessarily need to approach the text and just try to get the very, like, try to find some, like, very um, doctrines that are relevant to us and try to get them out of the text and all that. But I think a better approach would be to um, study the context of the time in a way and try to not eat, but context I think is important together with the text but even those shouldn't be and I think Skinner argues for this as well but we should also try to see or is this try to predict in a way in a reasonable way the intentions of the author in writing this because I think that's the that would allow us to actually see what they have tried to do with the text, with the argument, and what they were trying to appeal to. So I think the right way to, to go, and this is not what I think, but this is from my Skinner, um, is that we should study the text, the context of the time, on the, the surrounding environment, and also try to understand the intention of the author in writing this text. All three of them together, when they come together, I think will allow us uh, a right and a useful study of history of ideas or intellectual history. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions for now, I will ask something. Um, it's kind of going back to the point uh, on Wittgenstein's um, argument on 
definition as opposing to Socrates's uh, understanding of how to define concepts. Um, it's a bit complicated in my head, <laughs> the, what I'm trying to ask, but it made me think of terrorism when you were talking about this, because um, there's currently no internationally agreed upon definition on the concept of terrorism. There's no um, legal document in, in the international level that has a clear cut definition of terrorism because every country wants to keep its own definition and that's usually a vague one. Um, so that made me think, I mean, here usually I realize that I'm, I take more the Socrates approach that perhaps we should have an international definition of terrorism. I realize that we're going off the topic of history here. <laughs> this is more linked to my background. Um, so can they coexist, do you think, these two approaches to defining concepts in the sense that in this specific case, on the one hand, it would be good to have an international definition of terrorism, probably. And on the other hand, we should constantly be questioning whether this definition can ever accurately define a concept. So, yeah, do you think they're necessarily yeah, I mean, opposed these theories or can they work together for the greater good? <laughs> it's a bit of a complicated question. I'm not sure I understand yeah. it myself. But. But, but no, I think you, you kind of answered that in a way in the last sentence that you said, because can we actually have a definition of terrorism that would allow, that would be, um, that would capture all the cases of terrorism and then leave out the cases that we wouldn't want to characterize terrorism? Because I think this is a, actually an important issue. And I think there's sometimes a very thin line between terrorism and freedom fighting as well. And so, I mean, I'm not sure, I haven't really thought about how we can approach the concept of terrorism. And I think that's very interesting how we're thinking about that. But, yeah, if we come up with a very strict definition of terrorism, then, I mean, first of all, can we? And then can this exclude freedom fighters? Or do they, would they just like fall into each other, which would again become very problematic for international relations, I guess, uh, to like, I want to understand, I want to differentiate these two groups. So, but, but yeah, but I mean, I think the Wittgenstein approaches can still be quite useful because it would ask us to, again, to think about different examples of these um, of terrorist activities and to see whether they have something similar to them. And then maybe following on from that, if we want to have a strict definition, and Wittgenstein does believe that we can actually we can draw some boundaries that we can come with a definition, but it won't be a strict one. Like it would change over time as well. But if we want to, for our purposes, we can actually draw some boundaries ourselves, like some artificial boundaries in a way, and come up with a definition. And maybe in this field, that might be useful because you, again, we want to, I guess, separate these two. But yeah, sorry, I, I think I just, I was thinking on my own here a bit, but um, I don't have a definite answer, but I think it's very interesting. No, thank you. I think, you're right. I think I think it'd be good if the public perhaps could be um, more exposed to this Wittgensteinian approach to question the concepts that do have strict definitions in the law. Perhaps that's what I took in it, from that section of the of the mm. webinar. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe because yeah. I mean, how people would characterize um, terrorism would differentiate as well. And I guess for some people who have drawn very um, strict definitions on terrorism that some of us, um, or maybe most of us wouldn't agree with. I, yeah, I do agree that the Wittgenstein approach can be better because we can ask them to list different cases and then see whether the definition actually captures them. And I think it's a good way to go on with it. Any last, thank you, Desire, for your question, actually. Um, and uh, Evelyn Sell again. Uh, Maria has another question. Uh, number one fan today, tonight. 
<laughs> Can I? I don't want yes. to. Of course. Um, so I was thinking about the two opposing schools of uh, thought on uh, how knowledge is formed, which is uh, objectivism and uh, constructivism. And of course, there are uh, many grays in between them. So uh, for uh, for those, uh, for, for those friends who are not familiar with the term subjectivism is that there is uh, uh, something uh, said and uh, there is something out there which we can perceive uh, clearly with our senses. Um, so there is something, always something objective we can talk about. And then uh, in uh, constructivism, uh, constructivism argues that we construct uh, and knowledge based on our um, uh, context, positionality, experiences, uh, space and time we live, and so on. Um, so the first one, objectivism, is a bit more absolute, and, the, and constructivism is a bit more, uh, let's say, in, in many inverted commas, and, um, Relative, it argues that knowledge uh, is, is, is more complicated, it's not set and fixed. So I was thinking that maybe um, the um, social const const construct um, uh, constructionism uh, can be useful here in the sense that we should remember that the ways we construct knowledge are not simply based on our own experiences uh, and uh, on our own knowledge, what we learned. Uh, the ways we construct uh, concepts and knowledge is also, um, also draws on our on the ways we interact with each other, on our communities, because we form knowledge together. For example, in schools, we learn in a classroom. We don't learn as individuals. Um, in the society out there, Desiree uh, brought the example of uh, terrorism. Terrorism, to a large degree, is discussed by media. So we are forming concepts together. Um, so I wanted to, to, to throw this in the discussion because I think it's very important to always uh, remember that we don't um, um, very often we say, this is my take on things. This is my knowledge. This is my understanding, but what I'm trying to say is that it's very important that we, um, we remind ourselves that we don't know things, we don't believe things independently. Um, knowledge and beliefs and opinions and things always are formed uh, in interaction and with uh, in networks, and of course, this means that it is lots of um, uh, power involved too. Um, because when we communicate the knowledge, there is uh, always a sender and a receiver. So um, I, I hope I haven't opened uh, Pandora's box here, but I think it's an important um, point to be made. And I would be very... <laughs> Keen to hear any reflections from Evelyn Zell on this. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And this is actually a, an important topic that's been discussed in philosophy as well in epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. And there has been the increase of this like subgenre of epistemology, I say, called social epistemology. And in that field, people are offering what basically what you just said that. Um, our knowledge or like how we, first of all, we can have knowledge due to our um, social position. 
So there's the feminist standpoint theory just that, that says that um, women, because of their marginalized position in society, may have access to some knowledge that other groups may not, like white men, let's say, may not. Or it can also apply to race equally, that your social position can allow you to, can um, provide you with like, more knowledge, for instance. And there is a different aspect of it as well, such that um, your knowledge claims may be marginalized in a way because of your social position. So, and this has been discussed under epistemic injustice. So what some marginalized groups are saying are not easily taken as knowledge, whereas what other people like. Um, so, and there's, let's say the epistemic injustice is that, let's say in a court setting, a person from a marginalized group, their testimony, their um, what they are arguing for, what they see in may not be in certain case because they're from a marginalized social group and seen as knowledge, they are in a way dismissed. And so I think what you said is quite important and then we can see how knowledge has a social aspect to it as well. It's just not, um, yeah, it's just not very um, strict and um, understanding. Yeah. Any reply from Maria? Uh, no, I mean, I was... Um, uh, I was thinking a couple of days ago about mnemocyte, which is... Um, uh, we would say the the killing of of Nimi of, of memory, uh, and Nimo side would refer to marginalized memories or unofficial memories because of the very specific way we have defined collective memory to which I referred um, earlier. Um, so what we remember, what we choose to remember, um, um, as a ethnic or a national or um, um, a community. So it was very interesting. Of uh, it was very interesting what Evrenzel uh, said. I mean, it's 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 a bit different from epistem. It relates, but it's, it's different from epistemic injustice. Uh, but very much uh, general of um, um, it. It goes back, I think, to who has the the power and the means to define things. And what gets marginalized? So, yeah, um, absolutely agree with what Evrenzel uh, said. And again, Evrenzel, thank you so much for uh, for your talk. I mean, it opens up um, so many threads and so many discussions. So personally, for me, I think I have to go back and uh, rewatch it again. And I'm sure that after I do many more things, many more discussions and questions and reflections uh, will come up. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for today. Thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you once more, Brancel. Um, I think now we have uh, reached the end of this webinar. We are going to stop the live stream and the recording and uh, we can continue outside a bit more with the conversation if for those who please. Um, thank you for watching this webinar and uh, being with us for the pilot season. This is the last episode of our pilot season and we are excited to launch um, our first uh, season in uh, September. Uh, so follow us on social media. Um, and make sure you are updated with us so you can 
uh, till when we actually begin the big season. Um, and thanks a lot once more, Evrencel and Desiree for this moderation and presentation. Thank you, Andres.